everybody. Welcome to the February Database Security Office Hours on the Ask Tom platform. My name is Richard Evans. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by my friend Bettina. Bettina is also the product manager of Oracle DataSafe, and she's going to talk to you about the new and exciting things they've been working on with Oracle DataSafe over the last couple of months. So good stuff, exciting stuff. This call is being recorded. It will be available on asktom.oracle.com probably next week. And we've got four years worth of presentations out there. There's previous presentations that Bettina or Michael have done covering Oracle Data Safe. Um, so you can see those out there on the Ask Tom platform. I'll share some links with you here in the chat as well. Uh, this is your session. This is our public session where we talk about announcements. We do a technical topic and then we can take some Q&A. We might take some as we go along or we might hold it to the end depending on timing. But anything you ask is pretty much fair game. Can't promise we can ask it. You can ask about something else and we can always follow up with you offline. So if you wanna share your information with us and have a conversation about something database security related, we're all ears, so please reach out, okay? Let me share the, the notes here. All right, here we go. Here were those slides that I was talking about, those notes, uh, links to the GitHub repository, all that information there, okay? So hopefully you don't have to remember any of these links. I've put them on the GitHub repository, okay? All right, so as far as announcements go, we always talk about patching. Patches were released around or on January 16th. Take a look at oracle.com forward slash security dash alerts for information on patching of all Oracle products. If you're using Rack, check out fleet patching and provisioning that can hopefully ease those gold images and create those uh, grid infrastructure and database gold images for your patching. And as always, Mike Dietrich's blog is kind of the, the source of truth when it comes to database patching and upgrades. He's a great resource and he has a lot of good posts out there. Again, we talked about this a little bit last month, but I just want to reiterate that the Oracle Identity Access Management does support non-default domains now. Alan Williams is the product manager of this, and he said most of it's been in place for a while, but now they are generally available to support non-default domains across your X, your Exa cloud services, your Exa cloud of customer, your autonomous databases, whether you're using serverless or dedicated, and your base database services, database, DBCS is what we used to call it. Okay, so exciting stuff. Most of our customers are using non-default domains, and so to have this capability across all of our Oracle cloud database environments is a, a pretty important thing that Alan's been working on. So kudos to him. Related to today's conversation is the release of DBSAT 3.1 and 3.0 3 and 3.1. 3.0 came out in November. Pedro and team released 3.1 here in January. You don't have to download both versions. You can just go grab the latest 3.1 version but they put a lot of work in here. They've incorporated some STIG and CIS changes, added additional checks, um, updated some of the existing findings. It now uses a JPython instead of Python. So you don't have to install Python anymore. Uh, additional platform support as well. So DBSAT is a fantastic tool, database security assessment tool that you can download from support.oracle.com. As long as you've got a, uh, a support contract with Oracle, you can go to support.oracle.com and download it. And why it's relevant today is a lot of these things will be incorporated into Oracle Data Safe. So Bettina will talk a little bit about, you know, hey, these are some checks we do and we follow what DBSAT does. DBSAT follows what we do. So we try to make them similar. You know, they, they, uh, they kind of go after different audiences, but two great tools and uh, great updates to DBSAT. For, for support notes, uh, Bettina and team do a great job at trying to get everything into the documentation. So uh, Bettina, Jody, and crew are always working on document updates. And I've tried to put all of these links into the GitHub repository that we have. So I put that out there. So videos, live labs, documentation, user guide, API guide. Bettina, you guys do a really good job at all this stuff. So. Um, if you have any questions, please, please reach out to us. If anything in the documentation doesn't, doesn't, isn't quite clear, you find a typo, 
you know, reach out. We, we go through these all the time and we're constantly going, oh man, I can't believe I looked right over that for a year, six months. So, and then get your hands on data safe as well. So you can go out to Oracle Live Labs. We've actually got three labs out there. I only have two listed on the screen here, but we've got three labs out there. The first one, the getting started with Oracle data safe fundamentals you can do on Oracle's Dime. So you can spin that up as a green button lab and explore Oracle data safe with an autonomous database. Um, great labs, again, always updated. I think we've, we're working on getting a lot of the new capabilities into these labs as well. So good stuff out there for you to get your hands on and understand. And beyond that, we've got labs on almost everything out there, whether it's TLS or TDE or Key Vault or Audit Vault or Database Vault or you know data redaction, you name it. Over 40 labs out there, more than half of them you can do on Oracle's Dime. Spin them up for two hours, four hours, go through the lab, go off script, you know, think about how you would incorporate this security into your environment, make changes. You know, you can blow that VM up, we don't care. It just gets deleted after the four or so hours and then rebuilt for the next person. So please take advantage of what we offer with Oracle Live Labs out there, okay? Bettina, I'll turn it over to you, ma'am. So yeah, thanks for, for having me, Rich. My name is Bettina Schäumer. Um, As Rich said, I'm the product manager for um, Oracle Data Safe, part of the database security PM team, same as Rich here. Um, data Safe is a solution, if you haven't worked with it, um, that we launched um, five years ago now. Um, so it's really um, helping you to secure your Oracle databases, no matter where they're running, if they're running in the cloud or on premises or in, you know, and when I say cloud, it could be the Oracle cloud infrastructure. It could be any other cloud environment, if it's AWS or Azure or anything else. Um, and what we wanted to do today is really focus on what are some of the new enhancements we have launched in the last couple of months to give you an update. Um, I think at the end, we're also going to ask if, um, if there's an interest for more of an overview session again. We haven't done that in a while, so um, you can let us know there as well. Good, with that... Just a few words on data save in general. And then, as I said, I'll, I'll talk about the new enhancements. And we have quite a few new enhancements um, that we just rolled out um, also this year. So in January last month um, that hopefully will will definitely improve the, the user experience and what you can do um, from a, um, to incorporate your own corporate policies, et cetera. So as I said, data saves kind of our unified security control center for everything databases. So we show you immediate risk around the configuration of your databases, the sensitivity of the data that you're storing in the database. And then also, you know, what are potential risk levels, for instance, for the users who are accessing your data? What type of data can they access? Um, if any of those um, user accounts would get compromised, what, what would that mean for your database, et cetera? We try to design data safe really as a um, very simple to use tool. So no coding required. It's really click clicking through data safe to see, you know, what are the risks that we have identified or the status of your database, the security posture of your database. We tried really to make sure that you don't need any special expertise um, for using data safe. As I mentioned, you can use it for both your on-premises databases as well as your cloud databases. In terms of um, features, so it's a cloud service running in OCI, which means we're typically releasing every week, every other week, new capabilities or new enhancements in data safe. Um, but what you see here on the screen is the uh, main features we have right now in data safe. Um, so we have security assessment, which quickly helps you to evaluate the security posture of your database. Really checking also, you know, how is your database configured? Do you have any settings that might impose uh, impact, um, um, that might introduce an unnecessary risk? Once you know how your configuration looks like, um, security assessment also helps you to identify any configuration drift. Has someone changed the configuration? Um, would that introduce a new risk, etc.? Then we have user assessment where we're really checking for highly privileged users, where we um, where you can then review what grant, what privileges these users have. You can even go down to, you know, what are the schema um, schema access details? So what can this user see? So if I have a sensitive data, let's say a customer data uh, table or an employee data, who has access to that table? Um, that is the level of detail you can go into um, user assessment. We also give you a lot of insights into the user profile here. So if you think about the profile, that also has a lot of implications on the security of your database. 
Um, do I lock users who try to log in um, with a false, uh, with a wrong password? How long do I lock them? Um, do I require, you know, complex passwords and so on? All of that is stored basically in the user profile. And we also incorporated the user profile inside here as part of the user assessment. Then when it comes to sensitive data, um, we have um, sensitive data discovery. We have over 150 predefined sensitive data types in DataSafe. Um, that is from personal identifiable information like your, your names, email address, passport numbers, SSNs, driver license, um, and so on. But then also financial information like um, credit card numbers or bank account numbers, um, employee information, academic information, and so on. So as I said, over 150 predefined sensitive types. And what we can do here is we can scan your entire database or certain schemas to find the sensitive information. We then tell you exactly where we found the information, which schema, which table, which um, column, what type of sensitive information did we find, how many values do you have, et cetera. And if you have any um, sensitive data that we don't cover in a sensitive data type, that's also something where you can just um, extend the model. You can create your own sensitive types on top of what we deliver out of the box as well. Then at, um, we also have data masking. So once you know where your sensitive data is stored, you also want to make, make sure you're not exposing this data in any of your non-productive environments, right? Because um, most of the times you take a copy of your production, uh, production environment, um, you let developers work on those environments, or maybe you have um, a copy for Q&A, you might have a, a copy for a training uh, environment and so on. And most of the time, those production copies are not as you know um, securely configured, or let's say the users who are accessing have, have maybe a little bit more privileges than in your production environment. So you really want to make sure you're not exposing any sensitive, any real data in your non-production copies. And that's where data masking comes in. It really helps you replacing those sensitive information with realistic looking data, but you know obscure data that are not exposing the actual information. Then we have activity auditing, which allows you to collect and centrally store all your audit records from the connected databases or your target databases in DataSafe. So if you ever have an incident, you need to analyze the data, you have now um, a central repository here. If you're just getting started with auditing, we also have some best um, or some recommendations on basic audit policies that you can enable also here from DataSafe and then provision back to your database. We have predefined audit reports that you can use to analyze the data, predefined alerts that you can help, um, that you can set up, et cetera. And then the newest member is the SQL firewall. And I have a couple more slides on that. Um, you might have heard this is a new core capability of the database coming with 23C. Um, as I said, I'll talk about that on the next slides. So if you already have a 23C database with the SQL firewall, um, in DataSafe, we now let you manage your SQL firewall policies centrally in DataSafe, um, apply them. So we basically provide the user interface for the SQL firewall management. Good, speaking of SQL firewall. So um, as I mentioned, it's, um, it's a core capability of the 23C database. And um, if you followed any of the 23C announcements, you might already have heard about it. But what we've done is we in, yeah, basically we integrated a SQL firewall now in the database. So um, this should help you with, you know, real-time protection against any common database attacks, such as, you know, SQL injection attacks, uh, anonymous, anonymous, I can never say that word, anomalous access, or, you know, if you have any um, user credential theft or abuse, um, the SQL firewall is, is there to help you. So what we're doing with the SQL firewall is basically um, you can create a allowed um, SQL statement list. So you capture basically what are the statements that a user can do on an application uh, on the database. You also capture, you know, what are the allowed connections. So from which IP address, from which um, client pro um, client program, from which operating system can a user connect to your database. So if you think about, you have an application running somewhere. Um, you typically have an application user in the database. That user can only, for instance, connect from the application server. So you can uh, limit that, that no one can just dial in or log in as that user from somewhere else. The connections, as I said, also you can define, you know, what are not the connections, um, the statements, what are allowed SQL statements. And then you can decide if you want to block anything that's not on the authorized list 
or you can monitor what uh, comes in, what is not on this authorized list. Um, in DataSafe, we now open or we um, offer now or we provide the management capabilities, the UI for that. So first of all, we allow you to start the SQL collection. Um, so you basically turn on the SQL firewall and then what you do is you um, say for this user, I want to you know, start, um, create this um, authorized SQL list and the user connection list. So you're starting the collection, um, let's say for your application user, then you're using the application as normally, you're letting that run for a certain amount of time. And then you're checking, hey, do I have any unique statements that are still coming in, any new unique statements? Um, if you run your application for a long time or for, let's say, a couple of weeks or so, then typically you've gone through all the different features of the applications. You know what SQL statements come in and you see, you know, there are no more unique statements coming in and then you can close the collection. Then the next step is reviewing the SQL collection and the user connections that we have um, um, protocoled here, and then you can go in, you can still do changes on the user connections. Let's say you have a new application server that you want to add um, as an allowed connection, then you can do that. You can look through the SQL statements if you captured everything. Um, what you also want to make sure is if you have any um, things that are running end of the month, right? Uh, month end closure, payment um, rolled, uh, or yeah, payment or something. Um, salary payments or so, you want to make sure that those jobs are also running while you have the collection still on. And then once you reviewed it, you can now enforce the SQL firewall. What that means is you can then say, hey, I want to block everything that's not on my allowed list. Or you can say, I just want to monitor what comes in that's not on my allowed list. And then um, the next step is then to monitor any of those violations. Anything that was blocked or that is monitored will end up in this violation report and you can check um, what's happening on your database. Let me show you firewall also in DataSafe. So if you are in DataSafe and if you haven't used DataSafe, where you can find that is here under Oracle databases, and then you see here DataSafe database security, that's how you get to um, DataSafe. And then here on the left, you see we have now the six entry here for the SQL firewall. And then let me show you one or two. So for instance, Give me just one second here. So if you look at the SQL firewall, um, let me show you this one as an example. Here, the SQL firewall is already enabled. I did a SQL collection at some point that I see here. And then also I have the SQL collection inside. So let me, let me go back here for three months. So where you see, hey, we did the collection for a while, you know, we saw uh, most of the um, interaction was here between the 14th of January and the 20th of, of January. We did all of that. And now we also have a SQL firewall policy enabled. Let's go over there. And then here on the SQL firewall policy, you see we're blocking anything that's not on the allowed list. Uh, and we're doing that for both the session context and the SQL statements. When you have a SQL collection and you, you're done with the collection, when you deploy, this is, um, these are the options that you have. So as you can say, uh, see, you can either block everything um, outside of the allowed se session context or the SQL statements, or you can say, hey, I wanna only block or, or you know, um, enforce the session context or only enforce the SQL statements. And then here under actions, you have then the option, do you just wanna block everything and um, block the violations? Or do you want it, you know, maybe for the first, you know, when you uh, when you start with the SQL firewall, just observe it, see, you know, what is coming outside of these allowed statements to see if you captured everything, um, lock it in the violations, obviously, in the violations report, and then you can switch this to block later on. Also, we're keeping these violation report in data, say, for 12 months. If you want to keep it longer, you can also decide that um, in, in addition to the violation log, you want to write this information to the audit log. So you can do that. And then for auditing, you have the normal retention policies um, where out of the box, you can have more um, up to seven years in data save how, you, how long you keep your audit records. Good, let me show you one other example here. So I have one database where I just turned on the SQL collection. Um, so that is still running. You see here, I started a SQL collection for the employee search prod user. And then if I go here to SQL collection inside, let me go to the last week. 
So you see this um, collection is still running. I'm still getting a couple of um, unique statements here in every day. Um, and this is obviously my demo environment. So there's not that much coming, um, but this is how it looks like. And then also here under session context, you see, hey, um, right now all the connections came from this IP address from the operating system user um, Oracle and from this client program. So if I would have another application server, I could just add that here um, once I'm done with my SQL collection here. Good, so much. Oh yeah, and then let me show you also the violation report here real quick. Oh, let's go back to SQL firewall. And then here on the violation report, Let's go to all violations. You see then everything that happened on these databases that was outside of these allowed lists, the allowed um, SQL statements and the allowed um, connections. Um, you have different filter capabilities here. You can look at a certain database. You can look at a certain time frame. Um, as you can see here, you can just look at the SQL violations or the, the context violations and so on. So you can filter that um, down here. Um, but you can see I have a few violations here that happened, you know, about two weeks ago. So here, if I want to learn more, I can open this up. Just look down here, and then I see the SQL statement that this user tried to do. This was the database admin user here, for instance, that tried to, um, you know, see some data that was blocked. Or it was not blocked, but it was at least um, um, sent to the lock here. Okay, good. So that is the SQL firewall. Then now I want to switch over to some enhancements we've done on security assessment. So security assessment, I mentioned that earlier. So this is where we do a lot of checks where we check, you know, the configuration of your database. We're checking here for best practices from Oracle, but we're also um, checking for rules from the technical implementation guide from the Center of Internet Security, so sys rules. Um, we give you a very comprehensive um, report for each database where you see exactly where we have identified any potential risk, any high risk, any medium risk, any low risk that we found. You can look into that. You can then, um, you know, remediate um, those risks. We give you more information on that, etc. What we didn't allow you up till now was saying, hey, if we found a high risk, you could not change that and say, hey, we've done other measurements uh, or other steps to you know, protect the database. So for us, it's not a high risk. We only consider it a low risk or you know, we don't consider that a risk at all. So that was not possible, but this is something we have now introduced beginning of this year where you can then also take the risk report and say, hey, yes, for us, this is actually a higher risk or this is a lower risk or this is something where we can't do anything about it. So what we're allowing you to do now is changing the risk level so that you can you know, meet your organization standards. Um, you can also defer risk where you say, hey, um, right now there's nothing I can do about it. Maybe there is a parameter that has to be set this way because the application only works this way. Um, then you can also defer that risk and maybe look later into it. Uh, maybe you have something where you're already working on it, but you know it's going to take you another week or so, then you can also defer that risk, for instance. So let me show you that also in the live system here. So let me move up here and then go over to a security assessment. So let me show you um, the security assessment report for this database. And if I scroll down here, you see you know, all of these checks we're doing. There's a lot of checks. Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, what I typically do is I'll just look at the risk level for now and I'll keep the pass in here as well. So that we're seeing a little bit of smaller list. Um, you also see, you know, someone already quantified a risk. We'll look into that later. But now you see here, these are the risks that we have identified. We have a lot of high risk here with a red color. We have a medium risk. We have some low risk and so on. So, so far, as I mentioned, you couldn't change the risk level. But we do allow that now. So what you can do, for instance, now, let's say you have the password verification function. Um, you're still working on it. You haven't done anything. So you want to, you know, kind of defer the risk and saying, yes, we'll, we'll take care of that next month or something. Now what you can do is you can use this little um, edit icon here, the little pen, go in, and then you have these two options, defer the risk or change the risk level. So let's say this one I want to refer, uh, uh, defer for now. Set an expiration date, so until end of the month, this is being deferred now. I'll save that. So this is going to update here now. 
So let's look in, at another one. Let's say you have a risk where um, I have, for instance, one of my customers, um, they think that inactive users is a high risk to them. So they want to change this. For instance, right now we found a few inactive users here in our database. They don't consider this a, a low risk. They consider that a high risk. So I just have to wait until this update comes back here on the top. And then what I could do is I could um, go ahead. Okay, now I can go ahead for this one and say, oh, I think I picked a different one. Hold on. Inactive users, here we go again. So for this one, they don't consider that a low risk. They can now change that, let's say, to a high risk or a medium risk um, and then save that. Um, let's say we do a high risk. They can also add an, a note here. Let's check the um, I don't want to give an expiration date because I really want them to work on that, and then I just save that. Um, another reason they might they might want to do is lower the risk. So we'll just wait until this comes back. And then let's say I have users with DBA roles. If I know that all these users that are coming up here are verified users, for instance, so let's see, you get that here. We get, we get all these users mentioned here. So if I already check these users and these are all, um, you know, users that should have that um, DBA privilege, I can also go in and either make it a pass so that it's not, or I can say low, um, depending on what I want. Um, and then I can note, add a note here. So here for this one, I want to lower the risk. Um, I don't want to have an expiration date because from time to time I might want to look at it. And then I also just save this here. Good. For all these changes, if I want to know what was changed, so I see it also here on the report, obviously. So inactive users is now a high risk, as you can see. Um, we have one that is now deferred. It has this kind of pinkish color. You can always also check in the risk modification report here, where you then also see, you know, who was changing anything here. As you can see here, inactive users, that's what we just did. The original risk was low. We changed it to high. Um, our justification is here that you see um, this one, the password verification function. We see this is now deferred you see the note that I added, and then also the expiration date for this. Um, one more thing that we've done as part of this is also, if you go back to the security assessment overview, where we show you, you know, um, how many high risks do you have across your board, uh, across your database, how many medium risk and so on. We introduce now also this deferred status here. Um, if I click on that, then I also see across my targets, which of the risks were deferred, which targets, so password verification function, I deferred that risk on two of my targets. So I can go in and see the details here of that target database. Um, and then also, for instance, jump from here to the assessment report, the detailed assessment report. Okay. Um, one more thing while I'm on here, let me show you that as well. So let me go back to our report that we've seen. So here on the overview page, you might have seen also what we have introduced here is the top five common controls. So this is really, um, those are the controls that should be in place, you know, to really make sure your database is not, uh, you know, um, open for attacks and so on. So as you can see, um, one of the checks we're doing here is encryption at rest. So your databases and your table spaces should be encrypted. Encryption in transit that we're checking here. Uh, we're checking that you have at least, you know, minimum auditing set up for at least logging, lock in, lock on of events. So to see if there's anyone, you know, trying to attack your database. Um, if your patches are up to par here on top or the um, if you have any password complexity checks. As you can see here, encryption, for instance, I have set up encryption in transit for all my databases. Encryption address, not for all my databases. So I have um, a lot of databases that pass this check but I also have two where I need to look into the details. So I can just click on here and then see for these databases, I need to evaluate it. So if I pick one of these databases and I'm not sure if those are active, but we can check. I could gen then jump from here to the um, security assessment. I see then here on top the ones um, that I need to check. Um, transparent data encryption, we're seeing here, um, we have four encrypted table spaces, one unencrypted. If I want to learn more, I just click on that and it jumps to the report um, to that place. 
And then I see I have an unencrypted table space, um, which is temp, for instance. So the top five controls that we feel every customer should have in place, those are now highlighted on top of the report. And as you've seen, they're also highlighted here um, in the overview of the security assessment. Now, let me go back to my slides. So that's exactly what we are seeing here. So those are the top five common controls again that you should have in place that we're now highlighting on top of the um, overview and then also on top of each of the reports. And again, just to summarize, it's, you know, are you using encryption, encrypted table spaces? Are you using encryption in transit, for instance, for your backups? Um, are you enforcing password complexity checks? Are you using auditing for at least lock on and lock off events? And then did you apply um, the patches that are out there? So those are the top, top five controls that you see now on top. Hey, Bettina, we've got some good questions in the yeah. Q&A. One of them might be, um, can you export that security assessment report? You can, yes. So in the, um, in the, oops, let me go back here. So yeah, if you're on a report, there is um, on top, you see the generate report button. So you can generate a report and then download it. So that is um, a little bit hidden here under uh, more actions. So you can generate the report and then download it. Um, you can either generate a PDF or an XLS file at this point. Um, also the security assessments is something that we're running automatically for you. So when you register a database, we do that every week, but you can also go in and change the schedule. As you can see, you can either run it weekly. Um, if you have a very critical database, you can also run it um, on a daily basis, or if it's, you know, just a, whatever a training system, you can do it on a monthly basis. So whatever um, is your preference here, Great. but by default, we're running it once a week. And then mm -hmm. another one related to this is, does the security uh, risk have the ability to integrate with other ITSM tools like ServiceNow? Yeah, so what we have for each of the features in data saving, sorry, <laughs> give me a second. <laughs> mm. I'm a little bit under the weather, so some tea helps here. Yeah. Um, so we do have for every feature in data safe, we have REST APIs and other client uh, um, um, interfaces available. So what you can do is, yes, you can use the REST APIs, the CLI commands or, or whatever you prefer um, to also extract the information from data safe and, you know, um, transfer it or send them over to another tool. We have some examples also in one of our live labs that show you exactly, you know, how you can download the security assessment report or, you know, access certain findings from the report and then send it um, to whatever other solution you might use. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let me go back to my slides. Here they are. Okay. So this is on security assessment right now. Then on user assessment, we've done a big enhancement here. Um, so, so far in user assessment, what we showed you for every single user. So first of all, we checked each user, we checked the privileges, um, the roles these users have to give you also kind of a potential risk level for these users. If any of those users would get compromised or if any would, uh, of those users would go rogue, um, would they be, you know, would they have a potential critical risk level, high risk level, medium, et cetera. Um, what we didn't include so far was what is really the object privileges these users have, the schema access um, level details, right? So this was now added to data safe. So for each of your database users, you see now exactly what are the schemas these users can access, um, what objects in the schemas can they access, do they only have select the um, privileges, can they alter the or update the 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 data, can they insert data, et cetera. So that level of details we have in, uh, um, integrated now. You can also see if you're using also in addition to user assessment, if you're also using the, um, data discovery in data safe, then we also know where your sensitive objects are. So if you look at the data and you see, hey, someone can access the locations table or can access an, an employees table, we also show you then if this is a sensitive object or not. Um, so really helps you um, evaluate access to any sensitive data, right? Um, who can access that data? Um, but also if you think about 
um, if you want to revoke a privilege from a user, you need to know how that was granted, right? Because it could have been granted several ways, right? So what we also include here with this new schema access details, we also show you where that uh, or how that privilege was granted. So you see exactly, was it a direct grant? Did it come from a role? Maybe you have several roles that grant that privileges. So you see that all here. So it really also helps uh, helps you if you ever have to revoke an, a certain access right from um, from one of your users. So let me show you um, this also in the live system. So let me go back here and switch over to user assessment. Oh, I can already go in here. So user assessment, let me show you here. <laughs> so this is the, oops, why isn't this coming up here? Oh, it's still loading, that's why. <laughs> I was like, why is this great? Um, so here, the user assessment you might have seen before. So here we show you, you know, what is the potential risk level of your users? I have a lot that are critical, uh, potential critical, high, and so on. I don't have any with low. Yeah, I do have some with low here. You also see at a glance if your users have DBA privileges, DB admin privileges, audit admin privileges. You can also click on here to filter it. Um, you also see, you know, what are my top five users that have the most schema access, for instance. And then this one where you also see, you know, when did my users last log in? So if you have any users who haven't logged in in over a year, it might be a good idea to check those and so on. So if I scroll down here to the user details. So what we had before is for this user Bettina here, for instance, I could see, you know, uh, what are the rules this user have? What are the privileges this users ha uh, user have? But now what we added is the schema access. So which schemas can this user um, access? You see that here in the details, but you also see that here under schema access, for instance, where we have listed that for all the users. So now let's say I want to know which of my users have access to, um, to schema HCM1, because that's where my application data is stored. So I can filter here. And then I get the list of users. You see, there are quite a few users who have this all schemas. I'll come back to that. But then also Bettina, we've seen she has access to the HCM1 schema. So if I click on here, I get the details. So here I can see she um, can access the employees table and the departments table. For employees, she has select privileges. For departments, she has select and update privileges. I also see how that was granted. So this was a direct um, grant here, access through object. It did not come from a certain role here, right? And then as I mentioned, if you're running sensitive data discovery, then here under sensitive, you also get the indication if this um, table contains any sensitive information. So let's look at another user who might have access here. So um, there's another user called Tina. She also has access to the HDM schema. So here we can look. Um, this user, for instance, has access to the locations table and the jobs table, so not the employees table. Um, she can just do an, a select on this table, and both of them also contain some uh, some kind of sensitive information here. So this is for the certain schema. So as I mentioned, you also see some users who have the all schemas here. So this just means this user has broad privileges, right? It, um, the DBA Debra, for instance, can access all schemas in our database. So if I click on this here, I get the details. Um, now, I was interested in the HCM1 schema, right? So I can click on here. Now I see she can do a select on any tables, create any index, read any table, update any table, and so on. But now it's probably more interesting where this, um, how this was granted. And then we see this user has a PDB DBA role that comes with a certain privileges. But this user also has the data pump cloud IMP role that has um, other privileges here. Um, so... If you ever wanted to revoke access to the HCM1 schema for DBA Debra, now you know where this is coming from. So you can either, you know, make a copy of that role and and uh, maybe you know um, get rid of some of those privileges, or you're assigning a different role, um, and so on. So at least it gives you a better indication now what you can do. If you want to know what are these tables on the HCM, you see this is also linked, so you can also click on here and then you get the list of those um, tables here as well. So big improvement we've done here. So definitely, um, if I go down here, so you have all this information here in the schema access where you can find more details. 
So it definitely helps you, you know, identifying who has access to sensitive information um, that you have in your database. And then also if you want to revoke any access right, it gives you, you know, the pass on how this um, privilege was granted. Bettina, we've got a couple questions here. Yeah. Um, does user assessment take into account database vault setup blocking any access? Um, it does partially. So let me show you. Unfortunately, I don't have that on my database. Um, but if I go back in here, for instance, so if there would be anything like DB Vault, you would see these table access constraint by, and then you would see um, if there's a realm, for instance, from the DB Vault, you would see um, DB Vault listed here. Hmm. Yes. Um, that's the level of details right now. Um, I don't have DB Vault set up in my environment, so unfortunately I can't show you more details, but this is where you would um, find that. Yeah, good question. I, I didn't even mention that. Okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then targets are defined at the database or the individual container, right? Yeah. So um, the database, yeah, you would um, basically um, register the PDB in DataSafe or, as I'll show you later, yeah. also you can also um, register the container data database. But yeah, you would um, register each PDB, each um, container database, uh, sorry, each um, root database separately in DataSafe as a separate data safe, um, database. Yeah. Thanks. Simply because that's where you're storing your data, right? The sensitive information, everything, the configuration is really on a PDB level. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Good. Then let me go back to my slides. Yeah. So we talked about this one. So um, user assessment now with the schema level access. Uh, would be also interesting if you find this helpful, you can just you know, if you have any comments on, you know, um, any features that you would like to use or so, you can also put that in the chat and, and let us know here. Then target database support. We actually added two things here and I think I need to speed up. We have 15 minutes left. Yeah. So we added now support for active data guard. So what that means is um, if you have an active data guard set up with cross regional setup, so let's say you have your primary running in Frankfurt and your secondary is running in Amsterdam or you have your primary running in Ashburn and your secondary is in Phoenix. Um, so far, you couldn't really register that as one database in DataSafe. So this is now what we allow you to do. So when you register your primary database in DataSafe, you can also add your peer databases, your standby databases to that. Um, has one big advantage, obviously, if you ever have a switch over or failover, then DataSafe can still connect to your database. You have no interruption of the DataSafe service. But there's another good reason why we've done that. If you have Active Data Guard and you're using auditing, then you also create audit logs on the secondary or on your standby database. And um, you cannot collect that from your primary database. You really have to go to the, your standby database to collect these audit records. And now that you know you can register your standby databases here, we know that they exist. We can create an audit trail to collect the audit records from your standby database. And now in DataSafe, you have really one audit collection for your target, including primary and um, um, standby database audit records. ADG support in DataSafe in this phase is available for Oracle-based database um, in OCI and also the Oracle XSCS or Oracle Exa database service on dedicated infrastructure. So for both those database types, you can now use this um, ADG in DataSafe. So when it comes to auditing, let me talk about a little bit more why we've done that. So sorry, this picture looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually not. But if you're writing audit records, you know you have your database tables um, um, here where we're writing your audit log for unified auditing, right? It's, it's written to these database tables. Now, if you have a standby database that's only open for read access, obviously it cannot write into the database tables, right? It's not open for write access. So if you have um, audit records on a standby database, what happens is it's written into these, what we call these spillover audit files. And um, these need to be collected as well. In addition, also each primary database has these spillover audit files. So if you now have a data say, um, uh, in data safe a database with active data guard and you register your primary and your standby database, we have to collect the audit records from all these different places, right? So in data safe, what you will see, let's say you have one primary, one standby database, so you have two peer databases, um, you will now see three audit trails. The first one is reading from the database tables here. 
Then the second one is reading from the spillover files of the standby database. And then you have a third one that's reading from the spillover files from the primary database. So if you are using this now in DataSafe, you will see, you know, two plus or, or N plus one audit trail. So N meanings, you know, how many peer databases you have in my example here too. And then you will always see one more audit trail here um, in DataSafe. But this really helps you in having, you know, consolidated collection of your audit records. Um, and we also ensure that we're not collecting any audit records um, as duplicates. So let me show you that also real quick. How does it look like for the target registration? So if you're in here, and let's say you're connecting one of the Oracle Cloud databases, you start the wizard. Now I'm collecting, oh, and let me change my, uh, let me do one thing first. Let me switch to a compartment where my database is and I don't have to select that every time. Okay, now let's go back here starting the wizard. So in my database here, I have one database that I want to connect uh, to DataSafe. So I select that here. We recommend that you start with a primary database first. So if this is a standby database, you see this little information um, uh, here that we're saying, hey, this is a standby only database. You know, we recommend that you start with the primary database. You can do whatever you want, but you know, if I now choose my primary database first, you see this little message will disappear. So now I'm adding this database here and let me get my details here for that database. Copied over, where is my, oh, here's my. So here's my database service name. Um, it's on 1521. I have my data safe user that I created earlier. And then obviously I need to provide the password for that user. And then this is new now. You see also here um, on the on the different steps, you see this new step now, select peer database. And when you enter the database on the first screen, so if we go back here, as soon as you select your database here from the dropdown, we check if this is an um, active data guard um, database, yes or no. If it is, then you see, hey, there's a peer database. We show you the peer database and you can now say if you want to register that as well. Um, you can review the information. If there's anything you need to change, you can do that here. And then you just hit next. Um, the rest is the same. So, um, you know, the connectivity options, I have a private endpoint that I'm using for the connection, security rules that I can add and so on. So all of that is the same as it used to be. So let me um, just go out here. I already registered the database. So now let me show you how that looks like once it's registered, should be this one. Now, once you have registered it, oh, and mine, I need to update my password, so don't, you know, ignore that for now. But now, once you have your Docker database here in DataSafe, you see these um, peer databases here listed. So I see I have a primary database, which is the DB System 2, and I have a standby database, which is the um, DB System 1 here. So you see now these um, peer databases, and then let me open this one up. One thing that I want to show you also for each of the peer databases, you also see the database unique name here, which is then just important for the target, uh, for the audit trails. So this is the registration part, but then I said also for auditing now, that looks a little bit different. So let me go back here to activity auditing. So first of all, the audit profile for this target, let me show you, this is this one. So here now you see the audit trails listed for this target. So um, I have a primary and a standby database. And as you can see, I have three audit trails. I see here, I have this one audit trail that reads from the database tables. And then I have two that are reading from the file system. And then this one is this unique database name that I showed you. Um, so I know where this one is coming from. And then if I go to my audit trails, same thing here. And let me... Um, so now here for this one, you see these three rows here. These are the audit trails as, that you can see here. Um, you see they're stopped right now. That's because my password expired. So I have to take care of that later. But this is how that looks like. And then if you have audit reports, and let me show you the all activity reports. This now has in the data information from all three audit trails. So let me select my target here. And let me copy over the target name. And then I probably have to go back a little bit more in the past to see some data. 
So now I get the audit records from this target um, here. And then if I manage columns, I can add this database unique name here as one of the columns if I wanted to. And then I see where that came from, um, from which of the database unique names. So from my primary or my secondary, if I scroll down here, should be some entries also from the other database. Oh, ah, yeah, here you can see. So this is probably then coming from my file system and so on. Good, that is for ADG. Um, let me come back here. So one of the major enhancements we also introduced this year. And then one of the things we introduced in um, also, yeah, end of uh, end of January actually is now that you can also register your root database and data safe. So right um, before that, we only allowed you to register PDBs, um, but we got the request from quite a few customers that they also wanted to make sure that your that their root databases are configured securely. So we allow you to do that now as well. So the only difference is if you register your database as the database service name, you give us the um, service name of the container database. The rest is basically the same. But what it allows you now is obviously to check the configuration of your root, con uh, root database, making sure you don't have any configuration drift. You can re um, review the privileges and roles of all the common users in your um, CDB root database. And then also you can monitor admin activity in the root database. So again, something that we um, just recently added last month. Then something we added end of last year, um, I mentioned earlier, we have over 150 predefined sensitive data types. Um, that was sometimes a little bit overwhelming for our customers saying, hey, if, uh, which are the most important ones? So we tried now to identify the most common sensitive types or the most important ones. Um, as you can see, these types include, you know, um, names, obviously, but card numbers, like bank accounts, um, SSNs, tax IDs, and so on. So um, first of all, on data discovery, and we're running out of time, so I'm not showing this slide, but um, if you're going to the overview, we're highlighting these common sensitive types. You can see, you know, um, where in my databases do I store any of this information? And then also do if you do a data discovery, so if you want to check for where you store sensitive information in your database, um, you see these common sensitive types first, so you can select from them. Um, if that's sufficient, uh, we always give you also the full list of sensitive types, so you can always go back and, and you know, select more from, from the rest of the um, sensitive types. But we're hoping this um, helps you speeding up the discovery process, really showing you, you know, um, the most common types. You don't have to look through 150. And then also helps you hopefully to focus, you know, if you ever want to do masking, it's it's always a good idea to not mask everything, but just focus on the most important ones. So helps you also to focus on what are the most common sensitive types, the most critical ones that I want to mask um, on my database. Bettina, we have a question related to this around PeopleSoft masking yeah. for FSCM and HCM. Okay. Um, so FSCM, I'm guessing, oh, okay, PeopleSoft. So PeopleSoft, we don't, yes, you can do masking with PeopleSoft. Um, the question is just, you need to know what um, data you can mask so that the PeopleSoft application still works afterwards. Um, as far as I know, there is a MOS node from the PeopleSoft team that shows you exactly what are the, the columns that you can mask um, if you want to do that. So you can do that. It's not that we have the, the whole process documented for PeopleSoft or that there's a specific template right now for PeopleSoft. That's something, you know, um, you can ask them if, if that's something the PeopleSoft team, um, if they want to do that. We're currently working with the EBS team, for instance, who providing that out of the box and data safe. Um, PeopleSoft, they have that node. You can use that node to identify what are the columns you can mask. And then, yes, you could use data safe to do that. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, good. That was sensitive data types. Sorry, a little bit shorter. And then one thing that we actually just rolled out this week is contextual notifications. And I know we're almost out of time, but um, let me show you real, real quick. So if you ever want to set up a, um, a notification in DataSafe or for DataSafe events, um, right now what you would have to do is you would have to go to rules in, in, in the OCI menu. You would have to find it. You would need to know it's under observability and management. And then at that, but for a rule, you also need to have a subscription. Then you would need to find where is that, or maybe you, you look here, notifications and so on. But it's a three-step process, right? So what we've done now in DataSafe here is 
we're bringing that to you. So as you can see here in all the features, you have now this new tab, which is called notifications, and you can click on that. And then for everything in the context of security assessment, you can now set up notifications. So we have the most common list here. So you can pick one, hey, security assessment has drifted from the baseline. You can pick that here. You give that name, um, the um, that a rule, that rule a name. Um, you can create a topic from here, so you don't have to do it somewhere else. So I'll call that also configuration drift. And then also here, again, you don't have to go somewhere else. I can set up the subscription. So now that what that means is whenever that event happens in data safe for a configuration drift, I'm getting an email with that. Um, if you don't want to just pick from the four that we have pre-selected for you, you can also click on this one. So that gives you all the event types that we have for security assessment. So as you can see, it's quite a list if you ever want to set up notifications here. So it really brings it down from chasing it in the OCI menu in three different places, setting everything up, and then not knowing exactly what you've done. But now you can do that here in one step in data save. Um, and let me just create that. And then you will see it also shows up here under your notifications. So you see then also what are the notifications I have set up. And we've done that for all the features. You find the notifications tab now under user assessment for all um, events around user assessment, data discovery, and so on. So um, we're bringing the information to you or these notifications to you. So hopefully it makes it much easier. Good. Um, and then, yeah, just to summarize, these are the features we talked about. The SQL firewall we launched last October together with the 23C database. The common sensitive types we um, introduced in December. Then most of the stuff came in January with the configure acceptable risk, um, the top five um, common security controls, the schema level details of, of access, active data guard support, CDB root support, and then the contextual notifications, as I said, just this weekend um, that was launched. Good, more information. Um, Rich has already shared some some um, some of those links on, on GitHub, right? The Live Labs, definitely something I would recommend if you're not that familiar with DataSafe, we have the Live Labs um, for, it's called DataSafe Fundamentals here. And then you can run that on your own tenancy or on our um, Live Labs environment. And then as you can see here, it really goes through all the different features in DataSafe step-by-step, you know, how do you set up um, security assessment? How do you set up a rule, et cetera? So all the features um, that we just briefly talked about are covered there. Thanks for hanging out with us a couple extra minutes. Hopefully you will join us in March for our database security office hours. Uh, Nazia, the product manager of ABDF is gonna lead it and talk about the release update 11 for ABDF 20.